we had finished over the last seven, seven weeks the um, uh, book of Revelation, uh, those seven churches, the letters to them in Revelation 2 and 3. And since this is the Sunday before Easter, I thought it would be appropriate to go back to the Old Testament now and uh, look at the Passover, which is really uh, what uh, much of Good Friday uh, was centered around. And we may lose some of the significance of those verses back there, so I thought it would be a good thing to go back and look at that again. Uh, we'll see how the Passover began, first of all, and we'll see how we can see Jesus in it, even though he wasn't walking the earth back then either. Because uh, Jesus is the reason why we don't have to go through those Passover rituals anymore, uh, because Jesus fulfilled everything that that points towards. And it doesn't mean that Passover isn't important anymore. Uh, it is. It's not like it, you know, we can completely ignore it. Actually, when we look at it, we learn even more about Jesus. And that's what I hope we'll see this morning. And we'll see how it still applies to us today. Um, normally, when we approach a passage like this, I go and tell you, you, know, you can turn in your pew Bibles, which you can, to page 48. Uh, it's in Exodus 12, and we'll look at the first 13 verses, but instead of reading the whole, all 13 verses, I'm going to sort of piecemeal it this morning because uh, I want to really focus on each section because literally every line here is filled with significance, and I think we sort of lose that whenever we read to 13 and then go back to 1 or 2 or whatever. <laughs> Uh, but uh, so in, in advance, we'll pray the Lord's blessing on the reading and hearing of his holy word. We'll just start and I will read uh, the first two verses here of Exodus 12. It says, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Well, that's pretty, pretty um, straightforward here. God declared Passover to be the beginning of the year, and that applies to Jesus as well. He is the beginning of everything for us. So there is significance there that we might have even passed over, not, you know, not to use a pun there, but when we, uh, read, when we read that on our own. So Jesus is our beginning, where everything in our life begins, uh, should begin and end with Jesus. And we see this when Jesus told us, take up your cross and follow me. That was a way of us, him saying, put me first in your life. You know, above any, anything else, all the desires and the things you want, I want you to put me first and follow me, and I went to the cross. I want you to be willing to do the same thing if, if that would be required of you in your life. And it doesn't leave any wiggle room at all for us either. There's people out there who say there's different ways to God and so forth. It absolutely cannot be that way because do you think Jesus would have gone through what he did just to be one of many ways? It makes no sense at all. And we know people are, why people uh, make those excuses because they simply reject God as he is and they want to create a religion of their own. But um, it is, Jesus is telling us he will not be second best in any of our lives. Uh, I think of the rich young ruler in the New Testament. Again, so many New Testament uh, connections to this chapter as well. He went away from Jesus sad because he realized that in order to follow Jesus, he would have to give away whatever he had. And not that Jesus was saying, you have to do this. He was simply doing it as a way to expose to him what was important in his life and what wasn't and what was not important was following God. And he certainly, the rich young ruler was not prepared to do that. Verse uh, three and four we'll take next. It says, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. 
If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. An awful lot of significance in here in symbolism. I probably won't even hit on all of it. But it's not a mere coincidence that God instructed Israel to sacrifice lambs. Uh, you don't get too far into the Gospel of John, for instance, before you encounter John the Baptist right in the beginning there. And he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In Acts, the very next book of the Bible, uh, you may recall the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. And he was reading the, the uh, book of Isaiah and he didn't understand it. But he was reading a passage about a lamb in there. And uh, he read that verse, and that was really what got to him, and he needed to understand it. It said he was led like a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. And once it was explained to him, that opened up the door to salvation for him. And that is the power of the Lamb of God through God's holy word. As I said, I could talk a lot more about each of these, but it's not really a Bible study here. But just to hit on some of these things, uh, we'll move up to uh, five and six now. It says the animals you choose must be year old males without defect and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. So here we see the fact that the lambs must be year old, okay? That means uh, also without defect, by the way. And these are intentional criteria set forth by God because Jesus, when he fulfilled these verses, he was year old in the sense that he was young and he was pure and he was without defect. He was year old in the ways of the world. Maybe we could put it that way. And if there ever was anyone without defect, that certainly was Jesus. And we can see how Jesus was the perfect fulfillment of that qualification. Uh, this was a passage. Uh, this was a passage that for me, whenever I uh, read it, uh, when I, I know when I first became a Christian, I didn't quite understand it but honestly it just sort of went ahead and re read what followed because you know otherwise I'd never make it the whole way through the Bible and what I didn't understand was how come it can be taken from the goats and the sheep to me that sort of seemed out of place well what would happen back then and I think even today to some extent out in the fields is the goats and the sheep would mingle together in the fields. And uh, from especially from a distance, it wasn't very easy to distinguish the sheep from the goats. So uh, I automatically thought of Matthew 25, uh, verse 31. Uh, Jesus talks about the final judgment. And he said, it is like, it will be like a shepherd separating the sheep from the goats. And so you have that same idea where everyone's together. It's not necessarily easy in order to tell the difference on the outside unless you look up real close. And even then it might be difficult. Just a cursory look really can't tell them apart. And it's a perfect analogy because people, okay, yeah, we have uh, some have different skin color, different hair, or maybe you don't have hair at all or anything like that. There's, those are fairly minor differences, but pretty much all of us have a head and two arms and two legs, and you can tell if it is a person or not. Similar to some, though, some of those are goats and some of those are sheep is what Jesus is saying. And that's just on the outside. When you go on the inside, you really see the difference. Everyone has different emotions going on, different intellectual abilities, and some people have a brand new heart for Christ, and they are the ones who are saved. They're the ones who actually have become the sheep. So this analogy of the sheep 
runs very deep through both Testaments, through the whole Bible. The next section, I'll take about the next four verses and go seven to ten here. It says, then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roasted over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. Okay, so here we have the food preparation instructions for the Passover. And these are given in detail because, again, they're very significant. Uh, as New Testament Christians, we are all too familiar with the blood of Jesus Christ. We sing songs about it. It's quite frequently preached on. Um, we have songs like there's power in the blood and nothing but the blood of Jesus. And you can probably mention uh, some more off the top of your head. But the interesting thing is what, back in Exodus 12, what they had to do with the blood. And that is put it on the door frames of their house. Question for us is, are we covering our door frames of our house with the blood of Jesus? And naturally, I don't mean in the literal sense. But I think of a famous verse of scripture, maybe you memorized this uh, years ago. Joshua 24, 15, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. These people in Joshua have the blood of Jesus on the doorpost of their houses. And how often do Christians really have that blood on their doorpost too? How often do we maybe allow our children or our grandchildren to do things that they just shouldn't be doing in our homes, yet we know exactly what they're doing and we allow it? Could be drugs, it could be a number of other things. And some say, we'll rationalize it basically. Maybe they'll say, well, it's not that bad, or at least they're doing it here where they're not out with other people and they can get seriously harmed. Or maybe, uh, well, it could be a number of ways to rationalize it. The fact is they're not following Jesus and they know it and yet they allow it to go on. The thing is we are called to follow Jesus and if you look at the whole life of Jesus, you'll never find a single instance where he condones sin. He loves sinners, but he always says at the end, go and sin no more. So if a person, especially a Christian, allows their children to sin without consequences, well, what makes you think that when they grow up and have children of their own, that they won't parent their children the same way? And there's a popular saying that I think applies here, and it says what one generation does in moderation, the next generation will do in excess. And I think that goes a long way to explaining the moral decay in our society that we see now. It's a fascinating uh, look at American history just since the 20th century. It shows how, this, how things have changed. Early 20th century, it was very common for the whole family to work the fields together. You had mom, dad, and the kids and everything. And uh, with technology, though, it pulled more people out of the fields because machinery could do it much more efficiently. And that's a good thing. But what happened as a result is that, well, now we can afford to send the kids to school for more years. And school's a good thing, too. More education is good. But what happens then is that with the Industrial Revolution, then you have this new phenomenon that really was unheard of before the teenage years. And you have movies about it in the 1950s, you know, James Dean and all that. And he's the cool kid with a car and everything like that. Uh, wasn't out working in the fields helping mom and dad anymore. And... As things happen, good things happen, but then I think the enemy uses the, uh, the residual from that, and it sort of pulls the family apart, though. Then you had times where the kids, from the, once they got on the bus in the morning, maybe they didn't see mom and dad until late at night, if at all that day. 
and things just tend to snowball like that. Uh, the 1960s, you had the hippie movement, and you had people saying never trust anyone over the age of 30, those kind of things. And like I said, it just it has snowballed greatly since even the 1960s. But you can see how one generation takes things a little farther. And there were some good things that happened along the way, don't get me wrong. But you get a little farther down that road than the prior generation. You think, well, they let us go do this. Let's, let's go just a little farther. And before you know it, you have you know, 2021 uh, American society out there. And that brings us to verse 11, which I'll read uh, right now. It says, this is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste, it is the Lord's Passover. When these events in Exodus 12 occurred. The Israelites had been enslaved for many years in Egypt, uh, but they knew they were going to be freed very soon. And so they had to be ready to leave at a moment's notice. That's where the Passover really plays an important role now. And myself, I see two applications here. Uh, there could be many more, certainly. First is in the when you accept Christ and you have the blood on your doorpost of your homes, it sets you in motion then. Now I realize, oh, there's so much to do. There are people who haven't been reached for the gospel. I now have work to do that I didn't have before. We don't just sit back and wait for the return of Jesus. Uh, we don't just keep a low profile, hope I don't offend anybody and that kind of a thing. We know there's work to do. Now, the second application, it concerns the second coming of Christ. Just like the Israelites had to be ready to go, well, we know we all have to be ready to go right now. Jesus could come back this very service this morning. We don't know, so we must be ready to be caught up in the air when that trumpet uh, call of the archangel uh, blows. So considering these applications, the first one, like I said, having a change of mind and wanting to do more things for the gospel, most Christians probably experience that. You might have deathbed conversions like uh, the thief on the cross, for instance, who was saved at the last moment. He didn't have the opportunity once he was saved to really do anything. But uh, regardless, uh, so the first one, most people, maybe not everyone, but everyone can see where that second application of being ready for the second coming of Christ is so very important because we all have to be ready when that time comes. And that segues into the last two verses of, of our section this morning, uh, 12 and 13. It says, on that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a picture of the future when Jesus returns again and judges the world, and I just wonder how many people out there have an accurate picture in their minds of who Jesus is. To some people, around Christmas time, you think, oh, he's a cute baby in a manger, okay, which is true in that, in that scenario. Other people might think, well, he was a nonviolent pacifist who taught a lot of good things, okay, that's correct too, but... These are just little snippets, little pictures of who he was. Um, how many people out there outside of the church do you think realize that Jesus is a mighty warrior who's going to ride into battle victorious on a horse? And he's going to defeat the enemy with a sharp double-edged sword. That's a far cry from the baby in the manger, that's for sure. God promises one day there will be a day of judgment. Uh, because he is faithful and he will not allow the world to continue rejecting him forever. He would not be a good God if he didn't punish evil. So this is something he, his goodness requires of him. 
that he's also merciful because he doesn't destroy everyone. He's merciful because he's, uh, he has provided a way that we could be saved. He knew that we could never do it ourselves either, so he took it upon himself to do that for us. So when we see his blood, we see his promise to pass over us in his judgment. And uh, actually, I'll read 14 here, uh, just since I, since I have it here. Uh, 14 says, this is the day you are to commemorate for the generations to come, uh, for the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. So we don't celebrate the Passover in the same way we did, but around Easter, we're still sort of celebrating it, though, just in another way. Uh, because that ordinance is lasting and it continues, it just takes a little bit of a different form. Jesus became that sacrifice and it would be meaningless for us to just go through these Old Testament rituals again, uh, picking out a lamb without blemish and slaughtering it and uh, painting the blood on our doorpost and all, because Jesus already took care of that for us. He is our lamb. Lent is fast ending here and it's a good time to take a look at your life too and uh this may not be the most applicable message for the average person in that it may not change what you're doing drastically on a daily basis, but there's always a reason to learn more about God and about Jesus. Why we do or don't do what we do, not just because we've always done it that way, but there's a reason. And much of that reason goes back to Exodus 12 and then the events that followed. And if somebody ever says to you, why should I follow Jesus? Well, Exodus 12 is a good place to start. Say, this is where we came from, and this is where we're at now, and this is what Jesus has done for us. Because we follow in the footsteps of all those who came before us, the ones who blazed the trail and established this church, for instance, in Kennedy's Valley, and multiply this by thousands and probably even millions of churches worldwide. People took the bull by the horns and they did what God called them to do. We are benefiting from us, but we should want our works now to benefit those who come after us. And it is that constant circle and cycle that we are in until Jesus returns and we uh, things will be completely different then. But he is the fulfillment of Exodus 12. And when those words were written, God told Moses... All this knowing that Jesus would be the fulfillment of these things that he wanted Moses and the Israelites to do. Um, that was the blood that they used. That blood could not atone for sin. So that was the big difference. Blood of bulls and goats cannot atone for sin. But thankfully we're looking at it from the other side of the cross and the other side of the resurrection. At Jesus' blood that does atone for sin, and we thank him for that. Let's now close with a word of prayer.